Good morning everyone, so welcome back to my channel. This is Jomar Adams again and I just want to welcome everyone back and I hope you are all doing well. So for today, I am very much excited to share to you what our lesson is all about for today and I hope you will be enjoying your opportunity and your moment to learn something new. So let's move on. So we are gonna talk about your vector borne diseases and for this moment i will be discussing a few um introduction to the different vectors and the diseases they cause and at the same time as we go al along we will be discussing three of the major vector borne diseases that are commonly encountered here in the philippines and those are your dengue your zika and your malaria okay so let's dig in so First, let's define some very important terms for us all. The first one is your vector, of course. So vectors, according to WHO, are any living organisms that can transmit infectious diseases between humans or from animals to humans. So what we're trying to say here are vectors are any living organism, be it an insect, be it a... A particular animal so most of our the things that we are going to talk about are actually flies ticks aside from that you also have different insects that will be introduced to you today so those are your vectors so when we say vector borne diseases on the other hand these are now human illnesses caused by parasites viruses and bacteria that are transmitted by, by your vectors so it is not your vectors that actually causes the disease they're actually just the carrier of your um, agent or your pathogenic agent whether it is parasite a virus or a bacteria all of them are being carried or being transmitted by your vectors. And according to WHO, we have a couple of vectors that I want to introduce to you today. The first one, again, the first one is actually very much important. But before we dig in, let us go first to serotype. So what we do we mean when we say serotype? So these are group of organisms that are actually characterized by a common set of antigens. So before we discuss what is an antigen and an antibody, so these are actually a group of organisms and they are actually being um, grouped an, on a common set based on their antigens. Okay, so let's go on. We also have your incubation period. So your incubation period means this is the bit the period between exposure of an infection and the appearance of the first symptom. So the moment that you actually was exposed to that particular pathogenic agent and the moment that your first symptoms appear, that is your incubation period. So we have examples of vectors and I will be showing to you the different vectors and at the same time some of actually some of their the diseases they actually cause first and foremost okay let's go to the most common and the most pestering at times we have your mosquito and your mosquito can actually be a vector for several diseases we could actually have malaria your dengue your filariasis your japanese encephalitis your chikungunya and your zika so these types of Actually, if you're going to look at it, so most of these are actually from dengue or from dengue down. Most of these are actually viruses, but you also have here your parasites like your malaria. So these are actually examples of diseases caused by your mos uh, diseases caused by diff these um, pathogenic agent being carried by your mosquito. So imagine how many diseases does your mosquito is carrying so you really have to be careful but later on we'll discuss deeper dengue zika and eventually your malaria so let's go to the next we also have your sand fly so your sand fly as you can see it's actually very cute if you're gonna look at it in the picture but you don't want to have this because it actually costs it actually carries um the the agent that causes your leishmaniasis and it is also known as your sand fly fever or your plebotomus fever. 
So your sandfly is actually a vector of your Leishmania species that actually causes your Leishmaniasis. On the other hand, it also causes your sandfly fever. At the same time, you also have your triatomine bugs. Your triatomine bugs causes your Chagas disease. Your Chagas disease is actually a, tri uh, a trypanosomal um, disease that is also known as your American trypanosomiasis. So your Chagas disease is also known as your American trypanosomiasis. I am very much specific in saying American because as we go along later on, we will also be encountering another one which is your African triatom triat trypanosomiasis. At the same time, I just want you to take down notes. I just want you to um, jot down in your notes that your triatomine bug is also known as your kissing bugs. Okay? They are also known as your kissing bugs okay kissing all right so let's move on to the fourth example that we have we also have your black flies yeah we also have your black fly that causes your onchoceriasis this is all this is actually a um a disease caused by your onchocerca volvulus your onchocerca volvulus you also known um you also know that the the disease caused by your black fly as your river blindness okay it is also known as your river blindness so we also have aside from your black flies we also have your ticks okay so ticks it causes your lyme disease and it all okay i'm sorry it actually causes your lyme disease so it's very important for you to um remember your tick because why why is it because it causes your it causes your Lyme disease and your Lyme disease is actually called it also known as your Lyme borreliosis which is an, an infectious disease caused by your borrelia okay it is actually caused by your borrelia and to be specific what type of borrelia species are we talking about this is actually an example of your um an example of um, a tick-born disease okay so actually what you see here are actually your that specific ticks that actually causes your that carries your Lyme disease are your isodes isodes species okay so going back again your Lyme disease is caused by your Borrelia it's a type of Borreliosis specifically your Borrelia burgdorferi okay your Borrelia Bergdorferi. So, if you are, I hope you also have access the um, handouts that I have given you. So, you can listen to me and work hand in hand alongside with your notes. So, again, for your black fly, we have your onchoceriasis, also known as your river blindness, again, caused by your onchocerca volvulus. Your ticks, also known, also um, specifically, your ticks, your isodes ticks, cause carry your disease, your Lyme disease, also known as your Lyme borreliosis, that is being caused by your Borrelia burgdorferi. All right. So aside from that, we also have your cheche flies. Yes, we have your cheche fly, and it is it actually causes your sleeping sickness. Okay, it causes your sleeping sickness most commonly known um most um commonly known as well as your african trypanosomiasis okay a while back we were talking about your sand fly that causes your uh your triatomine bug rather your triatomine bug or your kissing bug causes your Amer american trypanosomiasis here your cheche fly causes your sleeping sickness also known as your african trypanosomiasis and we also have here your mites okay your mites that causes either your scrub typhus or uh, all right your scrub your mite that causes your scrub typhus your scrub typhus is actually being caused the are you ready to hear this because this is kind of um this is actually kind of cool because the the causative agent for your scrub typhus actually sounds like more of a Harry Potter spell, and that is your Orientia chuchugamushi. 
okay? Your scrub typhus is being caused by your um, gram-negative bacteria, also known as your Orientia chuchugamushi, okay? It's Orientia chuchugamushi, caused by, that causes your scrub typhus being carried by your mites. All right, let's move on. We also have your snails, uh, okay? So your snails can actually be carrying your schistosomiasis or your schistosomes rather that causes your schistosomiasis. So we have your snails, which are freshwater snails. So, and so let me first um, go deeper to your snail. So most of our snails um, are actually... Um, found on fresh water and they can actually carry your schistosomes so most of the time the larva of your schistosomes are released in the water and it penetrates the skin the skin of humans so if you have heard of your elephantiasis your uh no your elephantiasis your, ele your the, the filarial worm that causes your elephantiasis can also be found in your snail or your pohol aside from that you also have your other schistosomes that can actually cause your schistosomiasis aside from that we also have your lice okay your lice can actually cause two things your loose born relapsing fever that is actually caused by another Borrelia species, which is your Re Borrelia recurrentis. Okay, so your Borrelia recurrentis causes again your loose born relapsing fever. Okay, your loose born relapsing fever. So this is usually transmitted through small wounds in your mucous membrane or of the nose and mouth done by crushing the lice. So sometimes it's not really that advisable that you crush your the lice with your with your fingers or or anything that is unprotected because it can actually be liberating the bacteria that is inside your lice. Aside from that, um aside from your loose born relapsing fever again caused by Borrelia recurrentis, we also have your typhus fever. Okay? So what about your typhus fever on the other hand? Your typhus fever is also being um, carried by your lice. So the vector is again your lice. But this one, your epidemic typhus fever is actually caused by another um, pathogenic agent, which is your Rickettsia prowazeki. It's your Rickettsia prowazeki. So it is actually transmitted through again similarly on how your your loose born relapsing fever is being transmitted okay so as you can see your lice can actually carry i um two pathogenic agent one is your borrelia recurrentis eh, causing your relapsing fever and you also have your epidemic typhus caused by your rickettsia pro -wazeki. So those are actually different examples of your vectors and there are still a lot if we're going to name a, a lot more but for the sake of our discussion I will only be um we will only covered those nine so from the mosquito that causes your dengue malaria so on and so forth down to your lice aside from so today let's dig in now to a more specific disease or a more specific vector borne disease which is your dengue so your dengue is also known as your break bone fever so it is actually a severe flu-like illness that affects infants young children and adults so in short it actually chooses um it actually all member of the community is actually vulnerable to your dengue okay so it is actually us um being transmitted by two vector or to be specific two types of mosquito mosquito we have your aegis aegypti which is actually the primary vector of your dengue virus and you also have your aegis albopictus on the say on the other hand so your aegis aegypti is also known as your yellow fever mosquito and you also and your aegis albopictus is also known as your um asian tiger mosquito so these two are actually the common um the common vectors of your dengue the primary vector is your aegis aegypti and your aegis albopictus is actually the the secondary vector 
So let's move on. So talking about now, so we know that your dengue has a break bone, also known as a break bone fever. Some are actually calling it DHF or your dengue hemorrhagic fever as well. Again, caused by Aegis aegypti and Aegis albopictus. So your dengue, to be more specific, is actually caused by a virus also known as your dengue virus. So it actually it actually belongs to the family of Flaviviridae. And it actually have three, um, four serotypes. You have your serotypes 1, 2, 3, 4. So that, that is dengue 1, dengue 2, dengue 3, and dengue 4. All of them are actually seen here in the Philippines. But the most common is actually your serotype 3. The reason why I had it underlined and also colored differently from the others. Because your dengue serotype, serotype 3 is actually the most common here in the Philippines. Okay. So talking about its incubation period, usually it actually around 4 to 10 days before the first symptoms appear. So the peak biting periods of our Aegis species, specifically your Aegypti and your Albopictus, are usually early in the morning and actually evening before dusk. So uh, most of the time, if you actually observe m more mosquito or biting at this um time this is actually their prime time so might as well be more cautious about that so moving on now we let's talk about first the life cycle of our vector or the life cycle rather yeah the life cycle of our vector so adult the adult mosquito to be specific your female uh, mosquito are the one that actually is um, carrying the diseases so female mosquitoes lay egg inside containers holding water but this is the 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 thing here female mosquitoes can only be able to produce their eggs after feeding on human or animal blood okay feeding on human or animal blood so for male mosquito usually they feed on nectar from your flowers okay so they actually are somehow vegetarian if we're gonna say so unlike your female um aegis al aegypti and aegis albopictus they actually feed on human and animal blood to produce eggs so here you actually would uh, um, observe that they actually feed on human and they can actually feed on animal your aegis aegypti primarily feed on humans only that's why it is a primary vector as well of your dengue but your albopictus can actually um your albopictus can actually um feed on human and also in your animals okay so they need to feed on blood for them to produce your eggs eggs that actually usually are being laid on your water lines so anything where, where there is clean water, they actually would niche there for their eggs. So their eggs can actually hatch from a few days to several months. And it actually starts to hatch after being submerged in your water. So the eggs of your, your, your Aegis mosqui species are actually very hard. They actually stick to the wall of a container like a glue and they can even survive drying out for up to 8 months. And after being submerged to water, they actually would begin to, they actually would begin to, um, they would actually begin to um, hatch after being submerged in your water Submerge so in your moving on now moving on now we also have here after your adult after your egg of course next one would be your larva so your larva is the aquatic stage of your mosquito and it will develop into pupae in as little as five days so sa tagalog we actually have it as your kitty kitty okay so um, it is very important as as you all know most of the uh, most of our most of our uh, most of our mosquito larvae are actually being seen in stagnant water abandoned stagnant water so that's why you have to really um, clean up your surrounding when seeing some 
stagnant water because they can actually niche there. So aside from that, aside from your larva, after being your larva, again, they will develop to your pupa in five days. So in your pupa develop into an adult flying mosquito in just a couple of two to three days. So within two to three days, they will start pestering us 20 uh, in the morning and e early in the evening. So again, let's have a quick recap. So from the egg being laid by, again, of course, only your female mosquito, okay? Uh, your, your egg, it will now be hatched into your larva and then your pupa and then your adult mosquito now carrying your dengue virus so this is actually a quick uh, a quick picture from the centers of disease control we have here your adult ages aegypti so the female mosquito will, will lay eggs and it will hatch to your larva then it will be um the, it will develop to your pupa and in two to three days again it will soar and it will spread its wings and pester and feed in your blood so what about your dengue virus okay so your dengue virus again is a type of a flavi virus so as you can see your your flavi virus is actually an example of your um rna virus so having said that similarly to your coronavirus and similarly to almost all your viruses they do not have the capability to produce their own protein they don't have the machinery to produce their own dna or in a nutshell their nucleic acid okay so that is the reason why they need to infect a particular cell or they need to infect um, a particular cell for them to be able to for them to be able to hijack okay for them to be able to hijack the entire cell and the entire nucleus to favor them so the first thing that happened is that your virus binds to your cell and it will actually be fusing into your into the cell so that would be the entry of your virus and then it will now be start to liberate the genetic material in our case we have your rna at the same time you also have here your reverse transcriptase your integrase and your protease at the same time as you can see very much similar again to your coronavirus because they are both rna viruses and the first thing that they need to do is to produce a complementary dna out of that rna so that will be the the job of your reverse transcriptase afterwards it will now start to produce the um uh the the after having your complementary dna the second strand will again be made and then those um viral dna now will start to will start to will start to replicate within your nucleus so the dna the dna virus will enter here and it will be integrated into the host cell's DNA. And then, alongside with that, after replication of the viral DNA, it will now be trans it will now undergo transcription, then translation, where your protein starts to be produced. And then, carrying now the viral DNA here again, it will now start to have your variant assembly, and then it will now be released, thereby liberating more of your dengue virus in your system so that is how your dengue virus um that is how your dengue virus enters your enters your cell okay so afterwards what do we see in patients with dengue vi dengue fever your dengue hemorrhagic fever so these are the clinical presentations that they actually have First, we have your febrile phase, your critical phase, and your convalescent phase. So, these are actually three phases of your um, three phases of your dengue fever. So let's start with the first. Let's start with the first one. So, the first one is your febrile phase. So, the onset of your the onset of your your febrile phase is actually sudden. Aside from that. Aside from that, when it comes to your, when it comes to your febrile stage, the usual duration is from two to seven days. 
it actually from 2 to 7 days. So some symptoms include severe headache, muscle joint and bone pain. We also have your macular and macupopular rash. We also have minor hemorrhagic manifestation. So as you can see, some of the symptoms are actually very much similar to your flu. Aside from that, you also be you will start to observe petechiae, which are this one, and you also have your ecchymosis and your po and this is your ecchymosis. Your ecchymosis actually sim looks more similar to your hematoma, but your hematoma that is actually caused by an a um unsuccessful or erroneous phlebotomy, but your ecchymosis this is actually caused by or this is actually a manifestation. Of a particular disease. Aside from that, you also will observe a positive tur tourniquet test result. So I'll be discussing what is tourniquet test as we go along when we reach the different um when we reach the different um when we reach the different tests used for to detect your dengue. So aside from that, we go to your crit critical phase. So your critical phase will actually occur within 24 to 48 hours. So this is now where m much of the more serious symptoms starts to appear. Appear. So the first one is defervescence. So defervescence and then your plasma leakage and then eventually hemorrhagic manifestations like your hematemesis, hematochesia, and hemorrhagia. He so, menorrhagia. So, these are actually the hemorrhagic manifestations that will be observed when it comes to your, when it comes to your dengue, vi dengue fever. So, maybe you're w wondering what is plasma leakage, what is, um, what is your, what plasma leakage is all about. So, plasma leakage is actually a process in which the protein-rich fluid component of the blood leaks from the blood vessel into its surrounding tissue so you all know now that when in your blood that is actually majority of your blood is actually composed of your plasma okay it is actually composed of your plasma and the moment that your plasma start to leak out out of your blood vessel going to surrounding tissue that is your plasma leakage and your plasma leakage is actually a um, is a sign of your critical phase when it comes to your dengue hemorrhagic fever. So I'll go through that later after the convalescent um, the convalescent phase. So convalescent phase, this is now the time where resolution there is a resolution of your symptoms. symptoms symptoms starts to appear and your body start to cope up with the virus. So this is now the time where there is a normalization of your blood status and so after that you will start recovering from dengue hemorrhagic fever so for your dengue hemorrhagic fever we actually have a grading for that okay we actually have a grading for that so first we actually um the first thing that we check is the f fever with non-specific constitutional symptoms so what we do here um is first to perform your tourniquet test so we will now start to observe the appearance of your petechiae, okay? The appearance of your petechiae. So, after that, after that is grade grading one. We actually grade it two, okay? So, in addition to what you see in in your grading one, which is fever and then a positive tourniquet test. So that is grade one DHF or dengue hemorrhagic fever. DHF grade 2 is actually um, alongside with grade 1 symptoms and spontaneous bleeding in addition. So there is other bleeding. So you have your Herman sign, your petechiae, your gums are bleeding as well. You have melena, black tarry stool. You have low platelet counts because the, the normal platelet count is 150,000 to, to 400,000 Um a uh, cubic millimeter of your platelet so aside from that there is an increased hematocrit so the increased hematocrit is actually due to your plasma leakage aside from that so this is actually your um your herman's sign or your petechiae so that is grade two we call it grade three if circulatory failure is now 
um, being observed in addition to your grade 2 symptoms. So what are the usual signs that we see? We have your cold, clammy skin. So we, we say cold, clammy skin as alongside with that, there is a low blood pressure, increased pulse rate, and, and respiratory rate. So cold, clammy skin, actually, if you're gonna, I don't know if it's clear on your screen. So I, a cold, clammy skin, skin or hand is a palm that is actually very um, unusually dumb. Okay, so nagpapawis ang iyong mga palad. Okay, so aside from that, that is for grade 3. But a more serious, um, a more serious one would actually be your grade 4 dengue hemorrhagic fever where there will be it, there is actually a profound shock a hypovolemic shock in addition to your grade 3 symptoms so hypovolemic shock profound shock or dengue um, hemorrhagic your dhf shock is actually because of the plasma leakage so generally this is your grading okay this is your grading so we have your dengue fever or dengue hemorrhagic fever so fever with two or more of the following so leukopenia we say leukopenia when there is a low wbc count thrombocytopenia if there is a low platelet count but um so we, so but with no evidence plasma loss so we call it dengue fever okay dengue fever but we call it now dengue hemorrhagic fever when there is actually a start of a more serious um, symptom so that is from grade one grade two grade three grade four so i hope you would actually review this because this might actually come out in your final homework that will be coming out very soon so let's discuss now your plasma leakage so what you see here is actually the the, the progression of your plasma leakage so what happens first is this one of course after being infected your then give your dengue virus are present now in vivo inducing widespread mass cell activation so your dengue what happened is that your 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 dengue virus your dengue virus will actually start to um be detected by your mass cell okay it will actually induce the activation of your mass cell your mass cell is a type of a wbc that is usually um, found directly on your vascular endothelium so endothelium that in, that can actually increase the permeability thus inducing vascular leakage so your mast cell okay your mast cell your activated mast cell can actually secrete extracellular granules similar to your your basophil so actually they contain your histamine in your heparin so these are your mast cell so the moment that your dengue virus um activates your mast cell your mast cell now will start to secrete their ex external your extracellular granules that will now act upon into your 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 blood vessel what does this cause so the mast cell derived factors the intracellular granules that has been secreted are actually um the one responsible in increasing vascular permeability promoting now a pathological loss of in of vascular integrity to be exact what happened is that the what happened in your cells is that your vasoactive mediators actually increases the blood vessel size and diameter and it's actually um, responsible in breaking down the glycocalyx which, which is a barrier of your endothelial cell so one of the main uh, mass cells ma uh, one of the major mass cell um, product here so as you can see serum sp concentration of your mast cell specific product like your chymase start to increase which is correlated with the human disease severity so what happens is this chymase which is a major protease secreted by your mast cell are the one that induces a vasculopathy in within your blood vessel so what you can do is actually to prevent that to reduce that to reduce 
mast cell by using targeting drugs simil- like your Montelukas, your Chromoline, and your ketotifi- ket- Ketofin. Okay? Your Ketofin. Okay? So, these are the usual drugs that are being used. So, it is very much important for you to treat it immediately because if not treated, it may progress to Dengue Shock Syndrome. Okay? Dengue Shock syndrome and aside from that it's not just the mast cell that is being um, recruited in this blood vessels but also other immunological cells okay so that's how your plasma leakage happen again because of the mast cell the factors that your pla- your mast cell have produced or secreted plasma will start to leakage because of the increased permeability of your cell Aside your of your blood vessels rather, so aside from that we have principal symptoms. So again, high fever and at least two of this following: severe headache, severe eye pain, joint pain, muscle or bone pain, rash, mild bleeding and manifestation, and low white blood count cell. Aside from that, you also have this warning signs. So if you actually observe severe abdominal pain persistent vomiting, bleeding gums, vomiting of blood, rapid breathing, fatigue and restlessness, you really need to take your patient into the emergency room for a more intensive healthcare service and prevention. So, how do we diagnose your dengue fever or your dengue hemorrhagic fever? We actually have a couple of tests. The first you want to do is to screen it. You have to screen whether or not this is actually dengue fever or DHF or not. Or just a simple flu. So what you do is your tourniquet test. Okay, your tourniquet test and of course your complete blood count. Your blood will be collected by your medical technologist, process it in the laboratory, check your WBC and your platelet counts. Aside from that, you have your tourniquet test. So I'll I'll go on with the tourniquet test afterwards. So, we also have your confirmatory test. Your confirmatory tests are actually your dengue NS1 antigen where we detect the particular um, antigen that is specific to the dengue virus. Again, I mentioned it to you that your antigen or your epitopes are very specific to a particular organism. Although some can cause cross-reactivity, it is actually very much specific still. Aside from that, we also have your dengue immunoglobulin G and immunoglobulin M. Again, with first this during the class we had discussed the five classes of your immunoglobulin. So the most abundant is your IgG. Although your IgG is usually seen, so please write it down. Your IgG is actually the type of immunoglobulin that is usually found during the later stage of the disease and the IgM is the first one that increase or the first um, antibody or immunoglobulin to be produced by your plasma cells that produces your antibodies. So, aside from that, you also have your gold standard. We have your polymerase chain reaction, okay? And you also have your nucleic acid test. So, your polymerase chain reaction is very important. Why? Because, um... Specifically, your reverse, your RT-PCR, your reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction. So we have your rapid kits. This is the first one on top is your NS1 rapid kit and your dengue IgG IgM. We call it in the laboratory as dengue duo because you're trying to, you're trying to detect two antibodies. So you're trying to figure out whether it is a a, er, a new or an early infection, a dengue, fe- early dengue fever, or already on its latter stage. Aside from that, we go now to your tourniquet test. So what the what do we do t- during tourniquet test is of course we take the patient's blood pressure. So we inflate the cuff to a point midway between your systolic and your diastolic, and maintain that for five minutes. And afterwards, you reduce and wait for two minutes, and you wait for the appearance of your petechiae. To be honest, I actually experienced this when I was a kid. I actually had dengue before and the first thing that they do is actually your tourniquet test and then your complete blood count. What they did is actually to, similar to what they did here, your rumple lid test, that they actually used a blood uh, blood pressure cuff and then inflate it in a particular 
um, systolic diastolic and they actually start to rubber band the to rubber band that and then i would actually have to cl- to have my hands close open it's actually very painful at that time but it actually was their way to induce the appearance or to induce the the appearance of your petechiae so afterwards there is a positive tourniquet test so again this is grade 1 D- dhf positive um tourniquet test when there is a greater than or equal to 10 petechiae per one square inch of your skin so usually you're gonna observe that in your mid antecubital fossa okay your antecubital fossa you will be observing that there okay maybe you're wondering where is your antecubital fossa i cannot show it to you right now but i trust that you know this so remember you are finding the basilic vein okay when you're doing your blood pressure so you find your basilic vein the one towards your bo- the, the mid sagittal plane so the one nearest to your body the one that is actually just on top of your your radial your brachial artery so that that one is your antecubital fossa all right so blood transfusion so maybe you're asking sir when does a patient with dengue fever needs blood transfusion to be exact um to be exact the thing that they need is actually your um either a platelet concentrate or a an a fresh frozen plasma but seldom do they request for a whole blood or a packed red cell okay so that are different components of your blood so when do they need to be transfused with, with blood so this now um will happen when the platelet count in your adult start to drop as low as 50,000 cubic millimeter and for your pediatric patient as low as 20,000 cubic millimeter so imagine the normal is actually 150,000 to 400,000 cubic millimeter and they only have 50 okay so that is actually um very very low okay so you have to have your you need to have your blood transfusion immediately so both with active bleeding okay so adult with low platelet count and with active bleeding so that is all about your dengue fever and your vector borne disease i'm cutting it here um i'm cutting it here so i'll be discussing on our next video your zika virus and your malaria so thank you very much for um watching this video don't forget to hit the like to share it to your classmates to share it to anyone that you know would really need it and do not forget to subscribe to my channel to be updated for the latest video uploads that i will be making this week so thank you very much for um for watching and have a great day I had a few so again do not forget to sign up with a google form so that i would know that for if you're my student and you watch this please do not forget to sign in in your google in your google form for you to be able to have your attendance recorded thank you so much so i will be seeing you on my next video so thank you and god bless